Hi everybody and welcome to a new exciting video in the Generating Sound with Neural Networks series. Last time we built a variational autoencoder in Python and Keras and we also trained it. This time we're going to be finally back to audio related tasks. Specifically we're going to be building a full audio processing pipeline that will enable us to extract all the necessary features that we'll use then to train a variational autoencoder for generating sound. A disclaimer is due here. I'm not going to get into the theoretical details of all the audio signal processing concepts that I'll be touching upon in this video. I have a full series on those things and I will like send you back right to that series to acquire all of that knowledge. Before getting started, let me spend a couple of words on the data that we'll be processing here. And I've decided to go with this free spoken digit data set or FSDD. So here you have a bunch of speakers that uttered digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It, you can think of the FSDD data set as an audio counterpart to the MNIST data set. So I already downloaded it and you can find the link uh, to download this data set in the description box below if you want to follow along. But I have it here and here you see you, we have I believe something like 3000 digits, spoken digits here. Cool. Okay, so now let's go back to PyCharm and let's get started with the plan for this video. So we want to build a, an audio pre-processing pipeline. So this audio pre-processing pipeline is going to do a bunch of stuff. So first of all, it's going to go through all of those um, files that we saw earlier. And for each of those files, it's going to do five things. So it will have to do five steps. So the first step is that of load a file. After loading, we'll do padding. So we'll, we'll pad the signal, but we'll only pad it if it's necessary. Necessary. Then, once we've padded the signal, the next step will be that of extracting log spectrogram from signal. Okay. So I've decided to use log spectrograms and uh, for this, for the extraction, we are going to be using Librosa, which is a fantastic music and audio pre-processing or processing library. Then uh, once we have this log spectrograms for the files, the next step will be that of normalizing, normalize spectrogram like that. And finally, what we want to do is save the normalized spectrogram. Okay. And so all of these steps will be done for each of the different files that we have in the data set. Okay. So uh, what we'll have is basically for each of these steps, a different class, a different object that is responsible for loading, padding, extracting, spectrogram, normalizing, and saving. But all of these objects will be part of a higher level class that we'll call we'll give it a grand a grand name so we'll call it pre-processing pipeline okay like that so now let me just stub all of these objects so i'll do class loader and i'll do a pass for now then we'll have another class that's going to be called padder and yeah we'll also pass for now another class that's going to be called log spectrogram extractor and we'll pass here then another class which is going to be called min max normalizer so we're going to be using a very simple form of normalization called min max uh, scaling or normalization and finally, uh, no, we, we have another one that's the saver before the last one. So, and finally here, we're going to have the pre-processing pipeline. Okay. 
Now, if you're wondering why I've decided to divide all of this pre-processing steps into different classes, this is just because we want to have clean code and we want to separate concerns so that each uh, element in our code is gonna be responsible for only one and only one thing. Okay, so now onto the first class, so the loader, okay. So the let me just write a very brief doc string here. So the loader is responsible for loading an audio file. Okay, good. So we need a constructor here, and for the constructor, we want to pass uh, a few arguments. So the first one is gonna be the sample rate that we want to uh, load like the audio file with. Then we're gonna have the duration. This is gonna indicate the amount of seconds that we want to actually load. And finally, we have mono. So this mono is a Boolean value that if it's set to true, it means that we are loading in mono mode. Otherwise, we're just loading the audio file as is potentially stereo. For all reasons and purposes, really in music information retrieval, uh, we can use, we can analyze stuff using mono. Okay, so here let's create this attribute. So we'll do self.sample rate and we'll do an assignment with sample rate. And let me do the same thing with duration and mono. So duration and mono over there, cool. So now we need load. So this is the main uh, method for the loader class. And here we'll pass a file path like that. Okay, so we have a file path for the audio file that we need to load. And then we'll use underneath uh, Libreza for actually doing the loading for us. In other words, this loader class is a thin wrapper around a Libreza functionality. So first of all, we need to import Libreza. So we'll do an import Libreza. Now, if you don't have Libreza installed on your virtual environment or your Python, uh, then what you can do is quite easy. You can do a pip install Libreza and all of a sudden you will have Libreza installed. Okay. Good, so what next? Yes, so we need to do the, the actual loading. So here we'll call the signal and the signal, we'll obtain the signal doing a Libreza.load and here we need to pass the file path. We'll uh, pass in the sample rate, self dot sample rate, we'll pass the duration, and we'll pass whether or not we're using mono. So self dot mono. Okay. Now, uh, Libreza.load returns a tuple with two items. The first item is the signal itself, the second uh, item is the sample rate. Given we're not really interested in the sample rate, I'm just gonna uh, take the first index here. Okay, so that we are just gonna get back the signal. And then we'll do a return signal like that. Okay, now our loader class should be ready. Next, we want to build a padder class. So let's bring this one up here. Okay, so the Padder class is responsible. Padder is respon responsible to apply padding to an array. Good. Okay, so first of all, we need to pass, uh, we need to create a constructor and here will have only one argument that's mode. This is the type of uh, padding that we want to apply. So, and we'll set this mode equal to constant. You'll see in a second what this means. So self.mode is equal to mode over there. Now, padder 
is going to be a thin wrapper around a NumPy and a specific functionality of NumPy that's called a pad. Okay. So here we'll create two methods. One is going to be called a left pad and the other one a right pad. So a left pad. And for a left pad, we expect a, an array and the number of missing items in the array. We'll just pass for now and create a stub also for right pad. Okay, it has the same sig signature as left pad. So I'll just copy this one in and pass. Now let's understand a second what this uh, left padding and right padding are. So let's assume we have a, an array. So let's say one, two, three. Now we want to pad it uh, with say two items. And now you have two ways of uh, actually like doing padding. So you can prepend these two items at the beginning of the array, or you can append these two items at the end of the array. If you prepend them, doing something like this, zero, comma, zero, and then one, two, three, then you're basically doing a left padding because you are just prepending these two items. Now, specifically what we are doing here is called zero padding because we are padding this array with zero values. Okay, now if you want to do a right padding, what you would uh, actually do is the opposite. So you would uh, leave the array unchanged and then you would actually append these two zero values at the end like that. So this would be right padding and this would be left zero padding. Now, the mode called a uh, constant uh, is with like the NumPy pad function, what, what it does, it basically fills up the, the padded values with a constant, in this case, defaulting it to zero. But instead of like this mode uh, equal to constant, you could potentially use like other values for padding. So you could use the minimum value of the array, the maximum value, the min value. So you really have a lot of choices here. But for us, we're going to be using the constant approach with zero padding. Okay, so how do we obtain all of this now in code? Well, this is quite simple. Uh, let's call this padded array and we'll obtain it, it by using NumPy. So I need to import NumPy as NP first and now I can do a numpy dot pad and here I have to pass the array first and then I should pass a tuple that has two items. So the first item tells us how many items we want to prepend in the array and the second item is going to uh, indicate how many items we want to append to the array. So in this case, given we are uh, doing a left padding, we'll pass the number of missing items here as the zero index of this tuple, and then we'll say zero for index one. In other words, here we're saying, hey, just insert number of missing items to the left uh, at the beginning of the array, and, but don't do anything at the end of the array. Don't append anything. Okay. And then we need to pass the mode. And so we'll do a self dot mode like that. Okay. Now that we've obtained our padded array, we want to return it. So like that. Okay. So We'll do something similar with right pad as well. So I'm just gonna copy paste the implementation there. But of course, what we need to do here is just invert this. So we're gonna have zero items prepended and number of missing items appended. So we are just appending stuff at the end of the array. 
Okay, so this should be it for the padder. So we have both facilities for doing a left zero padding and a right zero padding. In our case, we're only gonna be using right padding, but I just wanted to show you also left padding because it's nice, you have like both possibilities and for your projects, you can you reuse it. Now we're moving on to the feature extraction parts. So we are gonna be implementing this log spectrogram extractor. Okay, so what does log spectrogram extractor do? Well, log spectrogram extractor, not surprisingly, extracts uh, log spectrograms uh, in decibels from a time series signal. Okay, so let's build the constructor here. So the constructor takes a couple of arguments. So we need the frame size as well as the hop length. Okay, so let's do self dot frame size like that and then self dot hop length we'll assign this the method that we want to build here is called extract and it takes a signal as input okay so what what's the process here? Well, first of all, we need to extract the short time Fourier transform. So we'll do a SDFT, and this is going to be equal to Librosa dot SDFT. And here we need to pass the signal. We'll pass the NFFT. That's the frame size. And finally, we'll pass the hop length. So self dot hop length. Now. If you're not familiar with the short time Fourier transform, don't worry. I have a video that explains that, or a series of video actually, regarding the short time Fourier transform that explain how it works, both from a theoretical standpoint and an implementation standpoint. And it has a very good intuition. So I'll leave you one of those videos up here. The final thing that I want to mention here is that the Libre's implementation of the STFT uh, it's going to give us a, an array that has this shape. So one plus the frame size divided by two, and then the, well, yeah, this is just becoming very confusing here. So I'll just move it to the new line like that. So this is a 2D array. The first dimension is going to be equal to this. And then we have the second dimension that's equal to the number of frames. But yeah, we, we don't really care about this. Now, the, the thing about this is that if we use a typical frame size, which, for example, could be 1024, we're going to get back a value for this first dimension that's equal to, I think, 500. 13. Now, this isn't really that great. So we want to deal with um, kind of like even numbers. So I'm just going to drop the last index here. So I'm just going to drop one of those frequency bins. That's what they are. And we're going to remain with 512 in this example, or you get the point here. So I'm going to slice this and do like a minus one uh, like that. Now that we are done with the feature extractor, let's move on to the normalizer. We are going to be applying min max normalization. So let me just write real quick a doc string for this. So min max normalizer applies min max normalization to an array. Cool. Okay. So what's min max normalization? The basic idea here is that we take an array that has different values and we take like the, the min value and we put it like to zero or to a certain value, we map it there and we take the maximum value of the array and we just like put it to 
one, for example, right? In other words, we take like the array and we squish it to a normalized range. This range could be zero, one, and this is what we're gonna be using, but it could also be minus one and plus one, for example. Okay, so let's create the constructor for this. And so here we want to pass a couple of arguments. So the min value, and the max value. So this is the, the kind of normalization range that we want to apply. So we'll do a self dot uh, min, and this is gonna be equal to min val, and then we'll do a self dot max, and this is gonna be equal to max value, like that. Good. So now we need to build a couple of methods. So one will be called normalized and another one, which is gonna be the inverse of that, is gonna be called denormalize. Okay, so we'll do normalize. And here, normalize takes a, an array as input. Yeah, we'll just have to stop for normalize and, de and denormalize for now, and then we're gonna implement them later. So we'll do denormalize like this, and we'll pass the, yeah, let's do a normalized array. And here we need to pass the original, original minimum of the array and the original maximum. In other words, if we want to reconstruct the original array, we need to know the original minimum and maximum values. Okay, so now let's start with the normalization process. So how do we apply this? Okay, so here we have to apply two steps. So the first step will normalize the array between zero and one. So what we're gonna do here is we'll take the array then we'll subtract to this array, the array dot min, we'll subtract the, the minimum uh, from this array, and then we'll do a divide that expression by the maximum minus the minimum of that array. So array dot max minus array dot min, like that. What happens here is that the array is gonna be squished between zero and one. So let me demonstrate that to you guys. So for example, if we're gonna apply, so if we have the, the minimum value here, so we're gonna have like array minimum minus array minimum, which is zero. And so basically like all of this expression is gonna give us a zero. And this is the the lower band boundary that we have. And then if we have the maximum, we're gonna have the array maximum minus array minimum divided by array maximum minus array minimum, which is equal to one. So the range is zero, one. Okay, so this is great if we want just to normalize between zero and one, but if you want to have other ranges for the min max values, for, say for example, minus one and one that are also quite common for training networks. So we need to do another step. We need another transformation. So let's move on to the next transformation. And here we'll do a norm array multiplied by self dot max minus self dot min plus self dot min. Great. And now we have the normalized array and this has been squished between the min value and the max value and so we can just return it like that. Now onto the denormalization part. So let's move this up here. And so what we want to do uh, with the denormalization is basically inverting the normalization process. So we want to invert this first and then we want to invert like this other part uh, as well. Okay, so let's start with the first one. So we'll do array. So let's invert this. So we want to get the um, this value here. So we'll do array 
So we'll do a normalized array, then minus self dot min, and then we'll take this expression and we'll divide it by self dot max minus self dot min, like that. Okay, yeah, here we have tiny mistake. Good. Let's move on to the second step now. So we want to invert this expression here. Okay, so we'll do array that's equal to array, and then we'll multiply this by the original max minus the original min plus the original min like that and now we can return the array now that we're done with the min max normalizer let's jump on to the next thing i don't want to work on the saver right now but i will work on the saver while we work on the uh, implementation of the pre-processing pipeline because the two things are a little bit more tied together okay so let's implement the pre-processing pipeline so Doc string for it. So pre-processing pipeline uh, processes uh, audio files in a directory applying the following steps to each file. What are these steps? Well, we can grab them from up here. So and move them down like that. One two indentations de-indented so for each file we're going to load load it load the waveform then pad if that's necessary we're going to extract the log spectrogram from the signal we're going to normalize it and finally we're going to save the normalized spectrogram now we, we saw that it's necessary for the reconstruction of a signal to have the original min and original max values of the signal itself. So what we need to do at the end of all of these steps is storing the min max values for all the log spectrograms. Okay, we need to store this information for each audio file so that when we're going to do the generation, we can reuse that. We can reuse that information for reconstructing the signal and denormalize it. Okay, so now let's create the constructor here. So um, here we are going to need to have an instance of all of these classes that we've built so far within the, the pre-processing pipeline. So we'll do self.loader, but we'll set this to none because uh, at instantiation, we're gonna just pass it the loader and all the other uh, objects by reference directly and assign them to these attributes. So we'll do a self.padder, self.extractor, and set this to none. Now, if you're wondering why I didn't put in here directly log spectrogram extractor, the reason is that we may be using pre-processing pipeline also for other type of features, for example, for MFCCs or what have you really. So we, we just want to be general, general here so that we can accommodate different types of um, feature extractors, one of which of course is log spectrogram extractor but here we may have a, an abstract class that stays on top of this log spectrogram extractor class and that provides an interface for all concrete extractors and the interface could be this simple method extract and then you can have implementations of those um, that initial abstract class one for log spectrogram another one for melt spectrogram so you could have a melt spectrogram extractor class for example Okay, following the same idea here, we're gonna have a normalizer attribute, not a min-max normalizer. Okay, and finally, we'll have a self.saver like that. Okay, and here we'll set this one to none as well. Cool, okay, 
So now let's create the main method here that is going to be exposed to the client code. So this, we can call it process. And here we need to pass the audio files directory. Okay. So this audio files directory is the path to the directory containing all the audio files that we want to analyze. Okay, so let's get started with this. So what we need to do, basically, uh, once we are like in this directory here, is go through each of these files one at a time and do all the pre-processing and apply all the pre-processing steps. Okay, so let's loop through these audio files in the directory. So for that, we need to import OS. We'll import the OS package and we'll do for root underscore because we don't need the sub -dears here and uh, files in os dot walk and we'll pass in the audio files there so in this case what's gonna happen is basically we are gonna loop through all the audio files in this directory also recursively if there are sub directories okay so now we need to loop through all the 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 files here because this is a list of files so we'll do a for file in files okay and now we need to reconstruct the file path because this is only the the file name we need the full file path and so how can we do that well that's easily done so the file path is equal to os.path.join will join the root. So this is uh, the, the root directory and we'll join it with the file like that. Okay, so now we have the full file path and what we'll do next is apply all of this steps. But we're not gonna do it in this uh, method, but rather we're gonna externalize that in a private method that we'll call self dot process file and here we need to pass the file path like that the process file method is really the bulk of this class so let's implement it now process file this accepts a file path as an argument and here the process file is going to just go through all of these five steps. So let's do that. So we'll get a signal or we'll load it using the loader. So we'll do a self.loader.load and, and we'll pass in oops, the file path. Okay, so now we've loaded the signal and now we have to decide whether or not to apply a padding because certain signals will need padding, others will not. And we'll see when is the case later on. So here we can have another private method uh, that's going to be called if it is padding necessary. As you can guess, this is going to be a Boolean method that's going to say or return true if padding is necessary or false otherwise. Okay, so if padding is necessary, then we need to pad uh, the signal and so here we'll have another private method that's called apply padding and this is going to be a, a wrapper around our padder object okay so I'll leave the implementation of this private methods uh, later for later because I want to stay at a higher level of abstraction here and then we'll fill in all the details okay so now we have our signal Add it if necessary, and the next step will be that of ex extracting our log spectrogram, or more in general, in a more abstract way, a feature. Okay, how do we extract our feature of choice by calling the extractor and calling extract, and we'll pass in the signal. Okay, next step, normalizing the feature. So we'll do norm feature is equal to self dot normalizer dot normalize and we'll pass in the feature. 
What next? We have to save the normalized feature. So we'll do a self.saver.save feature and we'll pass in the normalized feature like that. Now we want for this method to return the safe path. So we'll do safe path like that and we'll assign it this guy here. Now, um, what next? Well, we need to keep track, not just of the normalized feature, but also of the minimum and maximum values of the original feature or the log spectrogram in our case. And why do we need that? Well, we already saw that in the case of the denormalization. So we, to move from a normalized array to the original signal, we need to know the, the minimum and the maximum values of the original array. And so we need to store this for all of our audio files. And so for that, we can have another attribute that we'll call min max values. And this is going to be a dictionary where each key is going to be a safe path and then apply associated to each safe path, we're going to have like the relative minimum and maximum values for that audio file. Okay. So here we'll do a self dot and we'll have another uh, private method store min max value. And this method is going to accept three arguments. The first one being the safe path. And then we obviously have to pass the min and max values for this feature. So we'll do feature dot min and feature dot max. Okay, so we are done with the process file. Well, not really, because we have to implement all of this lower level uh, private methods, but yeah, that's what we're gonna do next. Let's get started with the first one here and then just go down one by one. So is padding necessary? So how do we decide whether we need padding for a signal? Well, first of all, I have to pass the, the signal as an argument. Okay, so the basic idea here is that given we load a certain duration and, and the duration is fixed for each audio file, and then we also know the sample rate, then we know the expected number of samples. So the number of expected samples is going to be equal to self dot loader dot sample rate multiplied by self dot loader dot duration. Now this can be a float number, so I'm just going to cast it to int. Okay, so this is the number of expected samples. Now, the thing is, if the signal has less samples than the number of expected samples, this means that the, the, the audio file is kind of like shorter than what we would expect. And now we need padding, okay? So here we'll do a if uh, the length of the signal is less than the number of expected samples, then we'll return true here. In other words, we do need padding. Otherwise, we'll return false. Okay, so this is a good implementation, even though I really don't like it that much. And I don't like it that much because this number is going to remain fixed across all of the different audio files that will batch process. But this value is going to be kind of like calculated every time we enter a new audio file. So can we avoid doing that? Well, we can. In other words, for doing that, what we need to do is setting this number of expected samples as, a, as an attribute. So we'll take this and we'll put it up here and we'll do self underscore number of expected samples over here. And we'll set this to none. And we'll see why that's the case in a second. So imagine you are going to change the loader um, at different times. And then every time you have to recalculate this number of expected samples. So number of expected samples really depends on the loader. So what we can do is apply, have like this loader as a property. 
So we'll do property, we'll define loader, and here we'll return self dot loader, and this is going to be like that. Okay. And now we also need a setter for this loader. So we'll do loader.setter. And here is where the magic happens. So we'll do loader. And here we'll pass a new loader. So here we are setting the, the loader. And so we'll do self dot underscore loader. It's equal to loader. But at the same time here, we need to change also the number of expected samples. So every time that we set the loader, we're going to I have, we, we're going to also set the number of expected samples and we're going to set that to this. Like that. Okay, but we don't need all of that. We can just take the loader and then like that. Okay. So this is great because now every time we change or we set the loader, we also get the, the number of expected samples uh, calculated dynamically. Okay, so here, of course, we have to change to this private attribute here. Okay, so is padding necessary is then finally done. Let's move on to apply padding. Okay. So here we'll pass the the signal like that. Okay, so what do we need for apply padding? Well, first of all, we need to calculate the number of missing samples. And the number of missing samples will be calculated by taking the difference between the self dot number of expected samples and the length of the signal. Okay. And at this point, we'll have the padded signal that's equal to self dot padder dot. And here we'll apply a um, left pad. Sorry, a right pad. <laughs> okay. Apply a right pad and we'll pass in the signal. Oops. And the number of missing samples. Well, I just noticed that we have a typo here. Number of missing samples. Okay. So, yeah, this is great. And then we'll do a return padded signal like that. Great. Next step will be that if getting like this store min max value. I'm just like leaving this saver that we still haven't implemented for last. Okay. So let's do this. So we'll define this private method that takes three arguments. So one is safe path, then we'll have the min value and the max value like that. Okay. So what should we do here? Well, here we'll do self dots min max values on safe path and then so as you can see we just create a new key in the min max values dictionary that's uh, equal to the safe path itself and here uh, that key has another dictionary so we have a dictionary of a dictionary there and here we have two keys. So one is going to be equal to min, and we'll set this one to min val, and then we'll have max over there, and we'll set this one to max val. Okay, so this looks good. So we are almost getting there. So the next step will be that of actually implementing the saver and the save feature method. Okay, so now let's move up here to the saver. So what the saver does, saver is responsible to save features and the min max values. Okay, so let's create the constructor here. And here we need, for the time being, one argument. And so this is, and we can call this 
feature save dear. We'll do self dot feature save directory and we'll set this to feature save directory like that. Okay, so now we need a save feature method. That's the one that we used in the pre-processing pipeline. Okay, so here what we need as an input is the, let me just like take the, the signature from here. Where is it? Okay, so we need, the, no, it's not that one, it's the normalized feature over here. Well, of course, like here we are missing uh, an argument, which uh, is gonna be the uh, original file path. Okay, so here we'll have the, the feature and the original file path like that. Okay, so first of all, we want to create the save path starting from our file path. And so we'll do self.generate save path and we'll pass in the, the file path like that. Next, we want to save the feature and the feature is an array so we can easily do numpy.save and then we'll pass in the save path and the feature. Okay, the next step will be that if creating this generate save path method, and here we have an argument that's file path. First, we need to take the file name from the file path. So we can take the file name, and for that we can use os.path.split and we'll pass in the file path. Now, um, split is gonna return a couple of values. So one is called the head, and another one is called the tail, which is basically the file name. So here we're gonna just index this to one. And now we'll create the save path, and we'll do it like this. So we'll do os.path.join, and we'll take the save so we'll take the self dot feature saved here and then we'll join this with the file name plus dot mpy, which stands for a NumPy array, right? And we'll return the safe path. The final thing that remains to be done here with the pre-processing pipeline is to actually store the minmax values dictionary. So, and we we'll, should do that at the end of this for loop when once we've processed and stored all of the different audio files. So now the, we have the whole dictionary with all the actual keys and we need to store it. So we'll do a self dot saver dot save min max values. And we just need to pass as an argument the dictionary itself. Okay. So let's implement this. And of course, this should be implemented in the saver. So we need save minmax values here. And here we just have as an argument, the minmax values dictionary like that. Okay, so the save path that we'll use is gonna be yeah, qu quite simple because we are going to do an os.path.join and here we're going to join the, uh, not the feature saved here, but rather the minmax value saved here. And so we'll do a self.minmax values save here. And this is yet another argument that we need to pass uh, to the constructor so that we can set it up when we instantiate the saver. But yeah, we'll, we'll take this and then we'll join this with min max values dot pickle like that. And finally, we'll do a self dot 
save and we'll do a saving here and we'll pass the min max values as well as the save path okay so what about this save well we can use pickle to actually implement it so that we'll serialize our uh, dictionary with uh, pickle okay so we'll do def save and here we'll pass data and save path now this is going to be a static method because we're not going to use any attributes or any methods from this class but rather we need to import pickle and we'll do it up here for serialization reasons okay so let's do this so we'll do it with open and we'll pass in the the safe path and we'll open this in writing binary merge as file and we'll do a pickle.dump pickle.dump and we'll pass in the data and the safe path like that great so now we are literally done so we have all the facilities for the saver also so i think like this should be working fine so one tiny thing that i want to do during this loop i just want to print some information that we are being active and successful with what we do so we'll do at the end of each uh, processing of each file we'll do a print where we say processed file and we'll pass the the name the the file path over here okay so this looks good let's have a quick recap of what we've built so far and it's been quite a long journey but uh, we should be proud of ourselves because we've done a lot of work so now we have a loader class that is responsible for loading an audio file a padder class that can apply different types of padding but we'll be using basically write pad in our batch pre-processing then we have a log spectrogram uh, extractor but uh, that actually extracts uh, log spectrograms from a time series the interesting thing that we discussed is that we could also abstract this and have a bunch of different uh, extractors that are concrete classes of an abstract uh, um, extractor class then we have the min max uh, normalizer with the normalizer and the denormalizer uh, methods and finally we have the saver class that does uh, a couple of things it save it saves the features and it also saves the min max values and of course on top of all of that we have the pre-processing pipeline that uh, does that puts together all the different steps that we've built and uh yeah it uses them for doing a processing of all the audio files in a directory okay so yes we've built a lot but i'm quite happy with what we have right now the final things that remain to be done is writing a little script that actually initializes all of these objects and then runs a batch pre-processing session so let's do that so we'll do if name is equal to main then uh yeah the first thing that i want to do is get a lot of uh, values for all the parameters for different objects that we need to build and here i'm going to cheat a little bit so i already have all of those values and i'm going to copy paste them here the only weird thing uh, is this duration that's equal to 0.74 uh, seconds and this is a value that I found like works quite well because you, you get like a nice a number of frames okay so at this point what we need to do next is creating instantiating instantiate all objects we'll start with the loader so the loader and here for the loader we need to pass the sample rate as well as the duration and mono cool then we'll have the padder for the padder we need to pass a couple of 
No, we don't need to pass anything really because the only thing is the mode that's defaulted to constant, which is great. Then we have the um, extractor, that's a log spectrogram extractor. And here, two things, the frame size first and then the hop length, great. Then we have the min max normalizer, normalizer. And here we should pass a couple of values. So the min value we want is zero and the max value is equal to one. And uh, finally we have the saver, the saver. And here we need to pass the spectrograms saved here as well as the min max values saved here, up here. Okay. And then we need the pre-processing pipeline. Okay. Good. So here we instantiate it and then we have to register all of these objects with it. So we'll do a pre-processing pipeline dot loader and we'll pass the loader over here. Now, let's repeat this five times. Yeah, and then change. The pattern is gonna be equal to this pattern here. Then the extractor is gonna be equal to the log spectrogram extractor. Then the normalizer. And finally, saver. Equal to the saver. Okay, so now the final thing that remains to be done is using this pre processing pipeline and calling process and passing what's the name of this? Yeah, the files directory over here. Okay, so we are done. We can just run this script and hopefully, if we don't have any errors, it should work. I come from the future and I notice that we have an error. So before we run this, we can solve that first. And the error is here with the save. So instead of passing the save path, we should actually pass the file. Let's run the script. Here we go. Now it's going through all of the audio files that we have in this. folder here and it's storing them in as spectrograms here in this directory. So it seems to be working fine, which is great. And at the end of this process, we should also have a pickle file here with the min max values dictionary stored. Okay, so the audio uh, pipeline is working as it's supposed to be, which is great. So in the next video, what we'll be doing is using all of this data that we've prepared uh, in this video for training a variational autoencoder for generating sound with all of these digits. Okay, so before I dash off, let's check. Yes, we have the minmaxvalues.pickle file, which is great. This was a very long video, but I hope you enjoyed it and you found it very useful. By now you should be able to build an audio pre-processing pipeline in a very modular way. Of course, this is a very simple pipeline, but you can just grow it bigger and bigger with more functionalities. But now you have the blueprint on how to do that. That's all for today. If you want to help the channel, leave a like to this video and subscribe. I'll see you next time. Take care.